Good afternoon, this is Eric Holloway with the National Weather Service on this bright and sunny afternoon. For May 13th, 2020, we have a couple options for you to further refine your search for weather. A 1-800 number, a weather.gov slash Alaska website. You can take off Alaska and put in Fairbanks, Anchorage, or Juneau. And lastly, we do allow you to contact us via email at the email listed below. Please email us if you have any questions, concerns, or any comments about the TV program. For the hazardous weather map, lots of stuff going on. We have wind advisory out for Thursday evening for much of the upper and middle Yukon. Winds are gonna be blowing up to 50 miles per hour in some areas of the, the basin. We also have several flood advisories out until Thursday afternoon. In the lower Koyukuk and middle Yukon valleys, we have reports of minor flooding in Alakakit. And then for the China project above the Moose Creek Dam, we have some high water there as well. And lastly, we also have a flood advisory out for the Salter River, which has experienced minor flooding as well. But please go to the hazards page and get the latest for those watches and warnings and advisories. And you can see these watches and warnings show up here for the flooding advisories that are out. We have for the breakout map on today, Wednesday, lots of this open water on the upper Yukon down to Fort Yukon, mostly open from Fort Yukon all the way down to nearly the mouth. We're still watching that down there by Imanic and Alakanuk, but uh, for the Koyukuk, also some high water there, some open in that uh, middle section, and again, a flood advisory out for there. We're also starting to hone in on the Kobuk and Noatak rivers. We have some some open water there above um, Ambler, but otherwise we're going to be focusing on those two rivers and then up on the North Slope. For the weather, turning to the weather, you can see that uh, low pressure system moving through the northern bearing westward. And then we have another low pressure system south of the Aleutians that is spinning uh, scattered rain showers across the eastern and central Aleutians. We also have a little bit of shower activity associated with the system in the bearing. But otherwise, generally pretty nice weather across much of the mainland. We had strong winds, strong pressure gradient from a high pressure ridge that's uh, across the Arctic Ocean, bringing strong pressure gradients across the midsection of the state, and that's the reason for those advisories. Otherwise, pretty nice conditions down in the southeast. They did have some marine stratus, otherwise uh, clearing out during the day as the uh, sun gets up high up in the sky. Today's weather, again, for you can see that low pressure system in the northern bearing moving westward across the Bering Sea, producing mixed precipitation, otherwise scattered rain in the lower Yukon. Otherwise, we have some rain showers across the Aleutians and Alaska Peninsula. And a 10, 12 millibar high in the Western Gulf, otherwise scattered snow showers, or scattered rain showers and a few snow showers in the Southeast interior. And you can see that marine stratus there on the Arctic coast. For tonight's weather, again, that low pressure system moving westward through the bearing, 1,009 millibar low now. Thermal trough in the southwest there, 1,005 millibars analyzed. And then there's that system that slowly drifts to the east, south of the Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula. And then finally, a ridge of high pressure there over southeast Alaska. Stationary front, and again, strong pressure gains through the midsection of the state fog and some snow showers across the Arctic coast. For Thursday's weather, 
1,011 millibar low now continued eastward or westward progression through the northern bearing still that thermal trough and low pressure system there 1,005 millibars now again for Thursday high pressure continues across the just off the panhandle though 1,014 millibars scattered rain showers associated with that weak trough otherwise that low pressure system south of the Alaska Peninsula will slowly drift east and then move north and then continued strong pressure gradients through the midsection scattered snow showers and fog across the Arctic coast for Friday's weather we're going to be looking at a new low pressure system 992 millibars approaching the central and western Aleutians and 992 millibar low now moving somewhat north into the southern gulf with an occluded front there and scattered rain showers continue in the Yukon Territory British Columbia otherwise snow showers with a front moving south across the Arctic coast scattered snow showers associated with that system for low temperatures on Thursday morning teens across the Arctic coast in North Slope 22 in Attigan Fort Yukon 27 Eagle 18 Kotzebue 29 Ambler 31 Point Hope 25 30s across much of the midsection down through the southwest with 40s Antioch and Bethel and then King Salmon 36 Dillingham 40 and then 40s in 30s across the Alaska Peninsula and Aleutians St. Paul 34 Kodiak 30 43 41 in Cordova 40s through the Panhandle 43 in Yakutat 45 in Haines for Thursday afternoon again warming up to the 20s across the North Slope Point Hope 36 50 in Fort Yukon 49 a little bit cooler than it has been over the weekend 49 in Eagle 56 in Fairbanks Northway 58 McGrath 58 50s and even a 70 there in Talkeetna 61 in Anchorage in the Copper River Basin mid 60s to low 70s there 59 in King Salmon 58 in Antioch 56 in Kodiak and 40s and maybe even a 50 across the Alaska Peninsula and down through the Lucians and finally through southeast 60s maybe in a 70 there uh, 56 in Yakutat for Friday morning we're gonna be looking at uh, teens across the North Slope Arctic coast with 23 in Point Hope 22 in Adigan 16 in Anaktuvik 29 <clears throat> for Fort Yukon 23 in Eagle 31 in Kotzebue 34 in Nome and then Galena 34 McGrath 40 43 in Antioch 41 in Bethel 41 in Dillingham 38 in King Salmon 43 in Kodiak 40s in upper 30s through the Alaska Peninsula and Aleutians St. Paul 32 43 in Cordova Yakutat 40 43 in Haines 47 in Sitka Ketchikan 43 finally for Friday we've been looking at uh, mid 20s across the North Slope Arctic coast there Kaktovik 27 Ukiavik 25 36 in Point Hope, 40 in Adigan 29 in Anaktuvik 40 I mean 52 in Fort Yukon 52 in Eagle 45 in Kotzebue, 49 in Nome, and then 52 in Northway, 56 in Fairbanks, 50s and low 60s through the midsection down to the southwest, 58 in McGrath, Antioch, 61, Bethel, 61, um, Lime Village, 59, King Salmon, 58, 56 in Dillingham, 40s and maybe a 50 through the Alaska Peninsula and Lucians, St. Paul 45, 52 in Kodiak, 47 in Cordova, 52 in Yakutat, 58 in Haines, Juneau State Capital, 58, 56 in Sitka, 58 in Ketchikan. Again, very nice weather, low pressure system moving northward after Friday. 
but it otherwise continued nice weather. The winds will be the big concern over the next couple days, and then some continued onshore flow bringing low clouds and low ceilings across the north slope with the chance of snow showers across the Arctic coast and into the north slope. But otherwise, the next system will be showing up in the Aleutians. By Saturday, with a couple of cooter fronts, one into the western Aleutians and one approaching the, north, or the, the Gulf Coast of Alaska. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Taking a look at the flying weather for Thursday morning, you can see that we have IFR conditions over the north slope, and this will remain with us for a couple days with strong onshore flow around a big ridge of high pressure over the Arctic Ocean. And with a weak low moving westward through the bearing, we'll see some IFR conditions out that way in the Bering Strait and down through the Bering Sea with marginal conditions down through much of the Aleutians. For Thursday afternoon, again, IFR conditions along the North Slope, marginal conditions through much of the Bering Sea, scattered areas of IFR conditions through the Eastern or Western Aleutians and Central Bering Sea. And under strong ridge of high pressure, marginal conditions over the Southeast and into the Southeast interior. For Friday morning, again, continued marginal or IFR conditions across the North Slope, marginal conditions throughout much of the Bristol Bay region, Alaska Peninsula, Aleutians, and through the Southeast and into the Northern Gulf. And Friday, again, IFR conditions with that onshore flow, marginal conditions through the YK Delta and the Southern Seward Peninsula and down through the Alaska Peninsula and Aleutians and marginal conditions in the Gulf of Alaska. Past conditions, anectivic marginal with IFR conditions on the north entrance and much the same there at Adigan. Lake Clark, Merrill, VFR. Very nice conditions on the Alaska Range, Rainy Pass, VFR conditions. Windy, VFR. Isabel, VFR. Over there in Mentasta, VFR early, marginal conditions by the afternoon, evening. Tanita VFR conditions, Portage VFR, Chilkoot and White under that big ridge of high pressure, marginal conditions down that way. Freezing levels, again for <clears throat> a meandering surface contour through the Bering and the, in through the southern mainland and across the portions of the um, outer coast there on the west coast and then down through southeast and into British Columbia, we have an area of elevated freezing levels there over the Chukchi Sea up to 6,000 feet, otherwise 8,000 feet across the Gulf region and down through southeast Alaska with a 10,000 foot freezing level just south of the Panhandle. Icing conditions for Thursday, I analyzed above 5,000 feet there in the central and Eastern Brooks Range and also down through portions of South Central, Southeast Interior and much of the Southwest Alaska Peninsula with between six and 10,000 feet in that area. Jet stream on Thursday, the jet just south of the Central Aleutians, 140 knot winds there, 55 knots over the Western and Central Aleutians, otherwise 45 knots across Kodiak Island from the South around that low pressure system well south of the Alaska Peninsula. Otherwise, um, northwesterly flow exiting there near the Yukon Territory and Alaska border there. Otherwise, 50 knots there from the east in the Seward Peninsula. And again, a 90 knot jet over the north slope there. 9,000 foot on Thursday around low pressure system just south of Alaska Peninsula. We're looking at 30 knots there in the Kenai, Kodiak Island area. 35 knots just near the Arctic coast there. And around that low pressure system, 40 to 45 knots, the strongest winds in that area. Southern end of the Panhandle, 25 knots in that area. 3,000 foot winds on Thursday. 
Again, that low pressure vertically stacked there, 25 knots from the southwest or east, I'm sorry, southeast or east, 25 knots as you get into Kodiak, 25 knots there again from the east across the Alaska Peninsula, and light and variable winds across much of the mainland, otherwise 35 knots there in the central Brooks Range. And North Slope again, pretty good winds up that way, 30 knots near the Arctic coast. And turbulence on Thursday, we're going to be looking at below 4,000 feet there in the around the central and western Brooks Range and down around the central Aleutians. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens of GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Eric, thanks so much for joining us again tonight. Happy to be here, Dave. Thanks, Eric. And uh, we've been talking about the complex uh, uh, gathering of information uh, from satellites looking down on the uh, surface of the planet and some of those orbits around the planet work for Alaska and some of them don't. There's a lot of challenges with those. Uh, how can we get better imagery for the poles and specifically for Alaska? Right. Well, today we're going to talk about a very interesting kind of satellite orbit that mm -hmm. has potential to be real helpful for the high latitudes. Okay. Especially us here in Alaska, Canadians, mm -hmm. Russians, Norwegians will all be interested in this. Mm -hmm. Um, the satellites are not in orbit yet. Mm -hmm. Now the future is, is uncertain, but it's possible, and if this happens, it will be wonderful huh, for Alaska. Okay. It's called the highly elliptical orbit. Oh, that it's good. interesting. <laughs> yeah. And okay. I think first, to help our discussion, we should get back to some of Kepler's laws and, and how do okay. satellites work. Sure. Kepler's first law, an orbit of a planet around a sun or a weather satellite around the Earth, mm -hmm is not necessarily a circle, it's an ellipse. Okay. And uh, the highly elliptical orbit mm -hmm. takes advantage of this aspect. We're gonna put the Earth in one of the ellipse and then stretch, one of the foci of the ellipse, okay. and then stretch that ellipse out real far to make it highly elliptical. And the foci is that, that bend part of the, the end of the ellipse. If you're gonna stretch out a rubber band, that would be the mm -hmm. center, kind of the stretchy part. The yes, end. Okay. yeah, exactly. Okay. And then um, Kepler's second law says, that the closer something is to the thing that it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. Okay. We see this in the solar system, that Mercury flies around the sun real right. fast. Um, Jupiter, much slower. Jupiter's further away, it's mm -hmm. slower. Mercury's closer in, it's faster. This happens with weather satellites, too. Mm -hmm. Even uh, satellites like the International Space Station, it's pretty close to the Earth. It goes around the Earth in only 90 minutes. Okay. That thing is moving. Yeah. It's only 250 miles away. So how can we take advantage of these two aspects of Kepler's laws of motion uh -huh. to get better weather surveillance of Alaska. And this highly elliptical orbit is going to be the approach. So we have with us today our friendly planet Earth right. and our simulated um, satellite that yeah. lit off of this salt shaker like here. There. Yeah. there it is, it's <laughs> shiny, it's metal, it's space worthy. And what we want to be able to do is, could you have a satellite hover over over the top of the world, up over Alaska. You mm, can't really do that. Geostationary right. satellites right. have to be over the equator. Okay. So how, how could we almost solve this? And this is, this is the tricky part. Maybe uh, should we uh, tilt the Can Earth tilt over? The other, focus we're, on the pole, that's what we're trying to accomplish right. here, right? So okay. here we have the northern side of the planet, mm -hmm. and we're gonna trace out the orbit of a satellite with this salt shaker okay. lid here. Now imagine a highly elliptical orbit, so let's put, the Earth in one of the foci of the ellipse, okay. and we'll have an imaginary foci out here. Okay. So the satellite will not go in a circle around the Earth, but will be in this long, strung out ellipse. Okay. So the satellite will go... Kind of like a racetrack. Yes, okay. there you go, like a racetrack. Okay. So it's an oval, elliptical yeah. shape like that. And notice now that when the satellite's over here, mm -hmm. we've got a nice view of the northern hemisphere the around there's down. Alaska, okay. Russia, Canada, mm -hmm. Greenland, all there. So that's um, the ellipse aspect of an orbit, Kepler's okay. first law. The second law saying that when you're further away as a satellite, you go slower. Oh. And this we can take okay. real advantage of. Huh. Because the way this orbit works, when the satellite goes over Antarctica here, right. it's going to be close to the Earth. Okay. It's going to be moving, whoosh, mm -hmm. goes on by. And then as it comes out here, it will slow down. This oh, increases what is known as the dwell time. The satellite will just hang here 
looking for mm -hmm. hours at Alaska wow. and the high Arctic. And then eventually it will come around and it will accelerate and whiz around the South Pole and then mm -hmm. come back and hang here for a while because it's further away from the planet. It goes slower. Yeah. It has to. That's the laws of motion. And such like that repeating. Wow. Now the, the real important way to make this work is you have to have two satellites. Okay. So that while one is whipping around the pole, you've got the other one out here. And they work as a team. You could then get a series of images of Alaska that okay. can be almost from a quasi a constant frame of reference. Right. And you can loop them together to make, uh, to make movies. You can take a picture every 10 minutes, say, uh -huh. of Alaska and then loop it, playing it at several frames a second. You, you can see the clouds whiz on by. You know, the Weather Channel, uh, weather broadcasters in the lower 48 especially mm -hmm. can show these movie loops from right. the geostationary satellites. In Alaska, we've never really been able to do that very well, huh. especially in the higher, most northern parts of the state, okay. because those geostationary satellites are over the equator, it's not a good view. And this highly elliptical orbit whipping mm -hmm. around the South Pole and then dwelling up here would be a way for us to get that constant frame of reference and do really good weather surveillance over the Arctic, seeing where those storms are, where they're going. Right. Nothing quite like a, a movie loop of the weather in time to really illustrate what's important, what's going on. And compared to what we have right now, we just have small windows or snapshots of what's going on with the mm -hmm. polar orbiters. We don't have that yep. long range view that's looking top down to give us that complete motion picture that helps us understand so much of, of the atmosphere yep. at this There's point. so many different kinds of satellites. Each, each has their advantage. Mm -hmm. Each is important. And the highly elliptical orbit satellite will also fit into that scheme. It, mm -hmm. It's a nifty idea to, to solve an Alaskan challenge. That's fantastic. Well, that sounds really exciting. Again, a, kind of a satellite dream of the future to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thanks for joining us today, Eric. We really appreciate the information. And if you'd like to learn more about what Eric does at GINA, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, we invite you to visit the web address that you see on your screen there. Uh, for Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. <laughs>but otherwise lower concentrations around St. Lawrence Island. Looking at the marine forecast for southeast, winds generally from the southeast at 10 to 15 knots, seas as high as three feet across the inside waters. Outside waters, winds generally from the southeast as well, 15 knots, seas as high as six feet. For southeast on Friday, inside waters, winds variable, 10 knots, seas as high as two feet. Outside waters, winds generally from the Southeast at 15 to 20. South Central, Thursday's marine forecast. Gulf coastal waters, winds generally from the east at 15 knots, seas as high as 3 feet. Prince William Sound from the east at 10 knots. Cook Inlet, winds generally from a variable direction up to 15 knots. Kamishak Bay, seas as high as 4 feet. And Friday's forecast. Gulf Coaster Waters, winds generally from the northeast at 15 to 25. Prince William Sound from the north at 15. Gulf Coastal Waters, looking at seas as high as 8 feet. Cook Inlet, winds generally from the northeast or east, 15 to 20 knots. Seas as high as 7 feet there in Kamishak Bay. Thursday's marine forecast. Alaska Peninsula, Kodiak Island, around Kodiak Island, winds generally from the northeast at 15 to 20. South side of the peninsula, north from the northeast at 20, seas as high as 9 feet. North side of the peninsula, winds generally from the northeast at 10, seas as high as 3 feet. And for Friday, around Kodiak Island, winds generally from the northeast at 25 to 30, small craft advisory like, likely there. South side of the peninsula, winds generally from the northeast at 20 knots, seas as high as 8 feet. North side of the peninsula, Winds generally from the northeast at 10 to 15, seas as high as 2 feet. For marine forecast, Lucian Islands, winds generally from an east or northeasterly direction, 15 knots, seas as high as 10 feet on the south side of the Lucians. And for Friday, winds generally from an easterly or northeasterly direction, 
10 to 25 knots small craft likely in and around Kiska and for West Coast Thursday looking at winds generally from the northeast at 10 to 25 knots around Priblovs winds generally from the southeast at 10 season size 4 feet up to 5 feet there just south just south of the ice pack and for Friday's forecast for West Coast winds generally from the northeast again anywhere from 10 to 20 knots seas as high as three feet in in the region from the arctic coast winds generally from the northeast at 15 to 20 and then the northwest coastal areas looking at winds generally from the northeast to 40 knots there just off of point hope likely gale warnings out there and then otherwise from the northeast to 25 knots around Kivalina just off the coast there and just off the Seward Peninsula 25 knots and then for Friday Arctic coastal areas winds generally from the north 15 to 20 northwest coast from the northeast at 25 to 30 20 to 30 and then same for the Seward Peninsula area Bering Strait winds from the northeast to 20. For tonight's weather looking at 1009 millibar low in the northern bearing moving westward and a weak thermal low in the southwest 1005 millibar a low well south of the Alaska Peninsula just off the map and then high pressure over south cent or southeast I'm sorry and then a stationary front in the southeast interior into British Columbia bringing scattered rain showers and fog and scattered snow showers across the Arctic coast and then for Thursday's weather again high pressure dominates the southern mainland 1014 millibar high scattered rain showers in the southeast and across Kodiak in the southwest these forecasts are for planning purposes only call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing always file a flight plan before you go flying the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.